Good morning. I'm Gert Matthijs from the Center for Human Genetics in Leuven in Belgium. And I'm presenting this uh, contribution on Belgium <coughs> together with uh, Mark Abramovic, who is the chairperson of the College for Medical Genetics in Belgium. Uh, after two big countries, this is a report from a small country, so the, the numbers will vary accordingly. But what I want to do actually is, uh, rather than to give you a vision on what we think should happen, I want to evaluate the vision of the previous generation of geneticists in Belgium who have created a framework which has allowed genetics to grow and to flourish. And the point for us now is to see how we can build genomic medicine on what's available. So this is why I'm taking you back to how we are organized currently in Belgium, how the reimbursement system works. I won't mention a rare disease plan. We're all working on these things. I won't mention somatic cancers. I'm just keep it, keeping to monogenetic, uh, monogenic diseases. And I'll give you a few examples on how we think we will be able to move into genomics. And then finally, I would like to talk about what's happening in Europe, but I would rather refer to Dr. Irene Norstedt, who is here from the European Commission. I can limit myself to cherry picking on what I think is interesting at the European level and useful, useful for the, the nations, actually. Um, so basically, genetic testing in Belgium, is, we have a public healthcare system. This is a social healthcare system. Don't be confused, it's not a socialist healthcare system, it's a <laughs> social healthcare system, which means that everybody complies to the healthcare system, but individual doctors earn more money if they see more patients. This is how it works. We have eight genetic centers, so all genetic testing is limited to genetic centers, which have been established by law back in 87, and that's where our, uh, our former generation has been visionary, I believe. And we have four centers in Flanders and four in Wallonia, because everything in Belgium has to be dividable by two. Um, and we do have, at the same, by the same token, we have a specific reimbursement system for the genetic tests, which has been in place since 88 as well, and which I would like to present to you. So here's Belgium. We have, as I said, on the north, we have the Netherlands. We're at the heart of Europe with Germany and Luxembourg on the east and France in the south. And just across the water, there is the UK. So Belgium is split into two parts, Flanders and Wallonia. And in total, these are the, the yellow sites are the ones where the, we have the genetic centers. So there's three genetic centers in Brussels. Uh, uh, two French-speaking, one Flemish, and then the others are the sites in, in Belgium. And I also would like to introduce our new king, because Belgium is a kingdom, and the king took over last summer from his father. Now, politics in Belgium is complicated, as you can see here. This is at the funeral of uh, Nelson Mandela. This is our king in the middle saying, look, guys, we outnumber the American delegation. <laughs> <laughs> and there is your former president saying, who are these guys? <laughs> and he's right because the politics in Belgium are quite uh, complicated and we have lots of prime ministers and vice presidents and so on. <laughs> but in genetics, we keep it simple and that's ah. the message. So at the national level, as I mentioned, we have these eight <coughs> centers and they're all associated to academic hospitals, which means we do integrate research and clinics and laboratory activities. Funding comes from the regions as far as it's, it's about prevention, it's about development, and funding comes from the national healthcare system as far as uh, tests are being reimbursed. And of course, we have to add grant money to make it operational. The reimbursement system has been very simple. Uh, back in the 80s, we have a reimbursement system for cytogenetics as well as for DNA tests as for biochemical tests, and it includes prenatal tests as well. So for the past two decades, prenatal tests have been reimbursed in Belgium. The system was a bit outdated, so now we have a new system which is stratified, where we have a stratification of the different tests, where we have a separate reimbursement of consultations, which wasn't the case previously, and we were kind of depending on testing to also be able to offer counseling. And we do have a specific reimbursement system now for samples sent abroad. You know, in Europe, a lot of samples travel, and we do have a cross-border system right now. And one thing I want to underline is that in Belgium, labs have to be accredited according to the ISO 15189. This is unique in Europe, I think. We should push hard on getting this through in all the countries. 
This is the extract from the old law, which says like a karyotype is reimbursed at 327 euros. That's the, latest, the latest reimbursement rate. Prenatal diagnosis is possible. And you see at the bottom that even before PCR was invented, the law in Belgium said that anything that was about hybridizing, hybridizing DNA would be reimbursed as a, ge a genetic test. This was, of course, built on southern blotting, but it happened to also apply for PCR. So all genetic tests have been reimbursed for the past 25 years. Of course, the system has been criticized. People were blaming us that we would get 370, uh, 327 euros for cystic fibrosis or for factor 5 or factor 2 or hypochromatosis. No one ever blamed us for offering breast cancer testing for 300 euros. <laughs> but it just indicates that the system only works when you have that system in place with a limited number of laboratories who then mix the two kind of things. So the new system now, which is in place since this year, has this stratification of the test. And in total, the budget for genetics in Belgium is 40 million for 11 uh, million inhabitants. Um, this is how the budget has grown over the past uh, 15 or 20 years. It seems like we're reaching a level at about 40 million euros. This is because the government is, of, of course, putting limits on what we can expand. And we'll try to push hard to get across that limit because genomic medicine will need more than classical genetics. So other people also claim that they can do a lot for four euros. Well, in Belgium, we offer genetics for four euros per inhabitant per year. We would, of course, like to see this double if genomics come in. But keep that in mind, four euros per year <coughs> per inhabitant. That's not a lot, and that's a lot you can do if you structure that well. That's the main message. So what does the new reimbursement system look like? As I mentioned, it is now stratified. So we still have reimbursement of karyotypes whenever we want to do it. We have reimbursement for uh, CGH arrays. But we stratified the DNA system in a way that the cost is closer, to, or the, the reimbursement rate for a specific cost is closer to the effective cost for the specific test. And what the genetic centers do is put year after year just see which test fits in which category. So the flexibility is on our side now, and as a result, we've now been reimbursing breast cancer testing at uh, 1,300 or almost 1,400 euros, so we're making a lot of money on breast cancer right now in our laboratories, but it may well be that this test next year moves into a cheaper one. But at the same time, because it's an open system, we can instantly insert gene panels. So the gene panels have entered in our reimbursement system in that top category. So no one would question whether these tests would be reimbursed, yes or no. We just put them in there, and the patient will only pay what is called a ticket moderator, which is about 8.7 euros. That's all the patients have to pay. Of course, we don't have reimbursement for exomes and genomes, and I personally refuse to <coughs> squeeze that into this uh, budget. Because if we do, the government will be very happy, but we will killing, be killing ourselves. So we want an extension of at least half uh, of the budget with at least 50% to, make, to be able to also cope with exomes and genomes. But nevertheless, I think I'm, as I said, thankful to the previous generation that we have an, a system which is flexible, which is cheap, which allows us to do a lot with not too much money. Uh, we work together to try and develop national guidelines, and we have, we're about to submit a, a model for reimbursement of exomes. Of course, the system is challenged, not in the least by private companies who think they can now reap the benefits of the, I would say, the best part of the uh, things, but we'll, we'll try and fight back uh, to make sure that they don't get started in these things. Now, one other thing is that we've have this Belgian Medical Genomics Initiative, and that's actually built on a research project. project. It's the only leftover money we have in Belgium um, at, the national, at the federal level for research. It's small money, I don't even give you the numbers. But all the genetic centers have put their forces together into a research project to look at genomics and, and, and research. And what we, I want to just hijack this to also make sure that we use it for standardization of how we uh, treat data for education of young geneticists as well as the public. So it's, it's going to be added on. The, the initiative to deal with it at the healthcare level is mingled with an initiative to deal with it at the research level.
And again, it's not big money, but we'll try to make the best out of it. So one way to doing this now is to put together a plan that will go to the healthcare system, to the Minister of Health, where we will say, okay, this is what the genetic centers commit to be doing to make sure that we introduce uh, genomics in the way it should be introduced. And all the buzzwords that are on here are the words that we've heard already this morning, like, yes, we have to deal with ethics, yes, we have to deal with informed consent. It's not a coincidence that we have divided this, this into eight tasks, because there's eight genetic centers, and I want the eight <coughs> groups to commit to the same big project. So each one of us will be in charge of one of the tasks and make sure we all move together to getting this uh, accepted by the Minister of Health and get the, board, the budget accordingly. As I mentioned, I wanted to just look at the European level. There's a few things there. For instance, there is that the Council of Europe has issued two years ago a recommendation that prescribes the way in which genetics should be offered in the individual countries. It's a document which is not often cited, and that's why I kind of refresh it here, because it tells people exactly, or tells nations exactly, how Europe thinks that uh, the genetic healthcare should be organized. Again, I won't go into details. The other thing is that, together with the support of the European Commission, we have been able to run a European project which was called Eurogentest for the past seven years or eight years. And one of the things we do in Eurogentest is to try and harmonize genetic testing, to try and improve the quality. And the latest thing we're doing now is to issue guidelines on NGS for diagnostics. They are built on the American guidelines. We're using the Dutch guidelines. We're stealing from the UK guidelines. We just want to put together things which are useful and which can be used by accreditation bodies to say, yes, your system fulfills those criteria. Most important things there are diagnostic routing, diagnostic utility. We've heard this this morning. And I would like to propose a scoring system as well so that people can compare the quality of exomes of gene panels between laboratories, between companies, so that people don't start to say, mine is better because it has 100 genes. If there's no clinical utility, it doesn't make sense. So these are the kind of things which we would like to propose. But because I'm here now, I'm not sitting down and writing the final version of that guidelines. I don't blame you for that. And the final thing I would like to say is, and that's all too fast, but we would like to lift those guidelines to the level of ERDIRC. <coughs> and ERDIRC has agreed that, yes, indeed, the Diagnostic Committee would definitely be ready to adopt the guidelines. And I think we should also include ERDIRC in most of the uh, commitments we try to make here to get this at the global level. So thank you very much for listening to this small country contribution. <laughs> Mark Williams uh, Geisinger, I, I was really impressed by this. I think it was very visionary in, in terms of the approach um, that you're taking, and really uh, like the idea of uh, the goals that you set forward in terms of the European efforts related to some uh, standardization. I think those are going to be groundbreaking uh, and hopefully something that this group can begin to work on. Um, I wanted to get a little additional information relating to the um, uh, testing uh, information that you presented. So uh, as I understand it, the government sets a budgetary target, says you have this much money to spend, but then it sounds like you, you have the discretion to say this is how we're going to spend it. Could you talk a little bit more about the um, uh, representation of the group that makes the decisions related to the budgetary allocations? Who's involved in that process? How do you manage issues that we're struggling with in this country, mm -hmm. uh, like the molecular genetics community versus the pathologists, for, you know, that everybody wants to have their little piece of the pie? That's, that's a lot of question or a lot <laughs> of answer. The first thing is, if it's about going to the healthcare system and the government and trying to defend genetics, it feels like going to the Colosseum in Rome, mm -hmm. where you know they play a little bit before they kill you eventually. <laughs> And this, is, and this is because the geneticists have no formal representation in these groups where the pathologist and the clinical chemist and the cardiologist have a seat. Nevertheless, we've learned that if the, if the documentation is good, if you can convince the government that whatever you do is efficient and helpful, I'm still here, I survived. Or at least the system survived. So this is the way to go. The other thing is that the disc we do accept samples from neurologists, from pediatricians. So it's not s 
limited in a way that only geneticists can preserve genetic testing because that would be outdated. But we have written in that reimbursement system that we can refuse tests. So if the geneticist or the laboratory person says, this is, this is ridiculous, this is lottery testing, we can say, hey, this we don't accept your test. But basically it's on a peer review basis, which definitely only works if, you, if there's mutual trust. And if you have piracy coming along, a system like this is, 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 is dead. So it's based on mutual trust and also based on the fact that we shouldn't eat each other because we are eight centers. If the budget is limited, we should start and compete amongst us. This would kill ourselves. Rather, we'll try and fight together to get a bigger budget. This is the only way out. Uh, Bruce Corr from UAB. The um, system of more or less centralizing the testing to a handful of centers and the reimbursement system grew out of a kind of rare disease paradigm where it was possible to concentrate patients in these centers. But as now we move to an era where maybe everybody with cancer will have their genome or at least their cancer genome sequenced or pharmacogenetic testing may be done on every patient, how does this scale so that it encompasses the entire health system? Well, it, it, that's the true challenge. And first, I think at the academic centers, we try and open it up in a sense that no, it's no longer the geneticist only who has access or the right to sequence the genome. That's outdated. So at the academic hospital, we will make sure that anyone can use that same uh, framework. And w in Leuven, we call it a hub where everybody can just use it, the laboratory and say, here's my data. At the national level, it's going to be a battle mostly between academic centers and private centers. Well, private, again, the one that work within the healthcare system, but do it on a, on a private basis. And this is not solved yet. Uh, but I hope that the nice thing about this monopoly, monopolies have never, are never right. And I'm one of the guys who has been fighting the breast cancer monopoly, so I should not say <coughs> monopolies are right. But a monopoly is right in the case you do as much as you can with as few money as possible. And in that case, I think from a political standpoint, this is where you need monopolies. This, this is where you need to limit the number of people who can offer this or this test. And we will just offer it as a service and let the interpretation be done by the experts, which are the cancer geneticists. Rex Chisholm, Northwestern. So you talked a little bit about the reimbursement system, but can you talk a little bit about who decides which tests actually f fall in those panels, for mm -hmm. example, might be reimbursable? But the, I think this is the beauty of the system. <laughs> Historically, we had a system where the geneticist didn't even have to argue about which was a genetic test. Of course, the government got upset about this, not the government itself, but the guys who didn't have access. So that's why we have introduced this stratified system. And the stratified system allows us to put, as, as I said, different tests or different diagnoses in the different categories. This is now entirely in the hand of the genetics ourselves. I mean, it's me together with my colleagues who draft that list hand it over to the government, the government stamps it for this year, and it's going to be reviewed next year. The thing is, if you put that in law, it takes you ages <coughs> before it's changed. This is true in France. If you have to get something in what is called the nomenclature, it takes you ages. So this is a flexible system, and that's why I'm defending it. It allows you to just, on the side of geneticists, change the list year after year. And then the discussion becomes between peers. If my peers or my <coughs> colleagues don't agree that, yes, this test is efficient, then I'll have to give in because otherwise it wouldn't work. So I think it has to do with clinical utility eventually. But right now it's like a, a small men's club dividing the job. But it's, it's transparent, for sure, and it's flexible. And that's why I'm a strong defendant of this stratified system. I want to export it, actually, to everybody. Okay, yeah, Rudy Balling from Luxembourg, just a stone throw from Belgium. Yes. Uh, you made some very strong comments. You, you partly addressed it about industry or private um, companies moving in, and, and you used the word, so we, we definitely fight back. I just wonder whether that's the right strategy and whether at least in, in some cases an alliance might be the better way to go instead of fighting back. It sounds yeah. very strong. Well, uh, I'm a street fighter, but you know, the, fighting back, the fighting back is against the piracy of one man's companies who say, okay, we'll offer genomics to the public. This is where we have to fight, I believe. If genuine companies would come in and say, we can offer 
on a joint basis, as you said, cheaper exomes, cheaper genomes, I think this is to be considered. The fighting is against the piracy cases of companies that say, yes, we offer carrier testing to the whole population and then just leave the population with the problems. So that's a, yeah, it's a different issue. I'm sorry.